everyone. Really nice to see all of you bright and early today. Um, thank you for joining us. This is our 23rd edition of MediaCorp's Executive Insights. Imagine this was a journey that we started last April and we've had um, 20, 30, 23 editions already. Today, we come on to an extremely hot topic. As you know, earlier this year, the government launched a multi-ministry groundbreaking the Green Plan for Singapore, um, a real milestone in, in our nation's journey. And in fact, it's very interesting how things have precipitated. Um, from the beginning of last year, you know, before even the, before the pandemic, we started seeing many of our partners come talk to MediaCorp about sustainability, green messaging, and all that. And so we've seen that the rise of that interest. And this is a topic that I think is, is on really on everyone's mind, especially since we've all been so locked up <laughs> for quite a while now. We've had lots of time to reflect and soul search on how we want our world to be. So I'm really so grateful today to have you know a fantastic panel with me. And you know, trust me, they've all come armed with some truly golden nuggets to share, right, everyone? But let's meet them now. First up, we have none other than one of the hardest working CSOs in town, um, Chief Sustainability Officers in town, none other than our friend Esther. Good morning, Esther. Hi, good morning, everyone. Yes. Um, and next, uh, next to her, I'm not sure how it looks on your screen, we've got um, uh, a, a, a good new friend, um, one a newly minted CSO at UOB. Um, um, Eric, good morning. Morning, Dashi. Morning, everyone. And um, rounding up the panel, we've um, I like to call her the resident tree hugger at MediaCorp, right? <laughs> Not, uh, and we have Rebecca, who heads up our corporate marketing and communications at MediaCorp, to who will, will also share how, as an organization, we've also embarked on this journey. Right, so um, without fur further ado, what I wanted to do was actually to get all of you in a very interactive mode. Okay, so a couple things. Um, Jade, that wonderful SQ voice that you heard um, opening up our webinar, you know, she's already alerted all of you that at the bottom of your screens, there is, um, you can, you can um, put comments, you can um, add questions, et cetera, into the Q&A box, do the chat. But I wanted to really start with a poll. I would like to know, we would like to know, how many of you consider the greenness of a product before making a purchase? So could all of you respond to this poll and we will see how many tree huggers we have in, the, in this room today. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always good for us to get a sensing of the room in this kind of virtual environment so that, you know, we, we, know, how, we know how to present and to make sure that we're not um, just sort of preaching to the converted. Okay, so. Okay, so when the results are ready, okay, I think the results fall squarely um, and in line with global research that I'm going to I'm going to be sharing. So many of you say that you sometimes consider the greenness of a product. I want to show where how you stack up in terms of how consumers are looking at this at the subject in in the next few slides. Thank you so much for your response. So. Sustainability was introduced in the 1970s, right? But it was really only in the 1990s that, you know, green brands started popping up. And, you know, honestly, over the last couple of years, I think that really fueled by what we were seeing in terms of natural disasters and then the pandemic really forced governments and companies and individuals to really look at far more sustainable lifestyles. And we've really seen this surge in conscious, and, I, and this, I love this word, conscious consumerism, right? We all need to consume, we need to buy things, but are we doing it in a very conscious manner? And people are becoming much more conscious about the products and services that they buy into. You know, they're putting their money um, behind things that they believe are good for the world that we live in. Now, you know, I believe that there's something called the virtuous cycle, right? Where it's that interplay between policy, consumer, very conscious consumer choice, as well as sustainable business practices. And I think they all fuel each other. And if we can work this virtual cycle, I think we would all be in a far better place. So what are consumers telling us across the world? Look at this. 
80% of consumers want to be able to make a difference in saving the planet for future generations. I mean, not we don't all have to be Greta Thunberg, but I think we all have the germ of that feeling inside because we all want to leave the world you know, a better place than it was when, when we came. So 72% are personally concerned about their environmental footprint. And that's a, that's a significant number. And I think mirroring what we saw in our poll, 66% choose to purchase products or services based on their envir environmental friendliness, right? And I think that this is so clear when you make just a short trip to your neighborhood supermarket, right? Every year you see, you know, those, the, the number of green products on the shelf seem to double, you know? For example, at my neighborhood supermarket, there now is a, an entire, you know, I think two shelf worth of non-dairy alternatives, right? Be it oat milk or, you know, and, and all that, that were, were really not on the shelves a long time ago. So it shows that consumer preferences, consumer consciousness are making companies sort of adjust and deliver to what we want. So the question is, what are consumers telling us that they want? They really want to have some form of stewardship, but they need our help as corporates and as companies that produce products um, in four key areas. They want the awareness. They want us to help educate them and to understand what is sustainable. They want to believe that what we say, you know, is based on some sort of trust and, um, trans and transparency. They also want end to an end to end proposition, right? Where consumers are eager to take action, but they also want to know how we can, we can help them in creating this, um, their own proposition. And of course, you know, we, we always say that buying green is not the greenest thing that you can do. In fact, the greenest thing you could do is actually to reuse and to upcycle. So the consumer out there is also very, very keen to know. Now, if I buy into your brand and if I buy into your product, are there ways that you can help me upcycle what I've just, you know, this economic transaction that I've just made with your company, right? So now the great thing about all of this is that, next slide, please. The great thing is that by activating what I had called the virtual cycle between policy, consumer choice, and sustainable benefits, you know, of sustainable business, the benefits are truly piling up quite nicely, right? If you look at these numbers, these companies are saying, yes, we have increasing customer loyalty, et cetera. And then also the revenue bottom line. So, you know, I guess to, you know, to put it, to put it in a very pithy kind of tagline kind of a way, it's less landfill, potentially more profit, right? So this is what you're kind of buying into, right? Or less carbon, you know, potentially more profit. And companies are saying, it is possible, right? And, it, you know, doing good and, and uh, doing well are no longer, it's no longer a mutually exclusive proposition, right? So, so globally, um, they're to help companies along in the sustainability journey. Uh, Jade, could you just plow through? Yeah, just plow through, just show, show the whole slide, right? To help companies along in this sustainability journey, an ESG framework has been developed. So what's E, what's S and what's G, environmental concerns, social concerns, and governance. So this actually acts as a guide for companies to help companies fully flesh out their sustainability strategy and taking into consideration key aspects that will drive the strategy. Now, now that I've given all of you some background as to what's happening out there, I'm really excited to get into the case study portion of our sharing today. So like, like you know, we have a case study from CDL, um, a view from UOB, and then also, you know, some of the fledgling efforts at a, a big media network like MediaCorp are making. So first up, none, we have none other than Esther from one of the biggest property developers in town, CDL, to share her company's journey. Now, this material is really going to be very, very rich, right, from our speakers. So please bear in mind, there's a Q&A box below. So please pen your burning questions. Okay, I guess we shouldn't be burning, right? <laughs> right, less burning, less carbon. So not burning, but your hot questions into the Q&A box. You know, I'm sorry if I'm going to be rife with all these puns, but just 
fill it into the Q&A box and we will either answer your questions in the flow of the presentation or we will take some of the bigger questions at the end during um, our very popular Q&A session. So at this stage, over to you, Esther. Thank you, Dustin. That was a very good background and uh, thank you for having me to share our humble journey um, since 1995. And uh, today, definitely sustainability is a mainstream agenda, whether it is on the political or business or even individuals' lifestyle. And um, so the million question is, the world is changing very fast. So how are we going to, you know, enhance, you know, our uh, resilience, whether it is climate or business resilience, to adapt to the fast changing world? And uh, next slide, please. So for businesses, definitely we talk about brand equity and brand preference. So in order to be to build leadership, business or business is no longer just about business, just about short-term profits. We have to look at long-term responsibility and sustainability. And in fact, in the next slide, research actually showed that, um, that this is conducted by World Economic uh, Forum annually on the Global Risk Report. And uh, once again this year, Climate risks are actually voted as uh, you know the top five among top ten risks. So both political and business leaders and academic leaders agree that climate risks are in, indeed business and investment risks. And now uh, you can see on the right hand side here, uh, to no surprise, you know because of the pandemic, the number one risk in you know is infectious disease. And look at all the green dots. All five out of top 10 are all climate related, whether it is, you know, natural resource, you know, loss of biodiversity, extreme weather, and even human impact on the environment and climate action. Uh, next slide, please. So climate action is not just, you know, a matter of political leaders or just business leaders. And uh, in fact, last year, we in the community, we called it the year of sustainability awakening. So how are we going to take stronger action? And uh, we have actually seen the world in action last year. Um, there's greater convergence of will and commitment. You can see here that there are so many, you know, all these acronyms, you know, and uh, whether it is, you know, the uh, race to zero, which is the largest actually um, alliance, uh, bringing country, region, city, businesses and investors together to join the race to zero. And uh, in fact, the three largest economies in East Asia um, have also pledged to slash their carbon emission to net zero. Uh, for Japan, South Korea, the, the, uh, the target is 2050. For China, it's 2060. And uh, for a longer time, you know, um, sustainability and green has always been, you know, uh, led by the European, you know, community. But I think I'm really excited that we can see Asia are stepping up fast and furious. And of course, U.S. is back in the game, you know, back in, you know, in the Paris Agreement and also have the, its own Green Deal and committed to, you know, plans to be a 100% clean energy economy uh, with net zero by 2050. Tall order. And U.K. has been doing a lot of good, you know, um, uh, and, uh, um, ambitious uh, targets and all in preparation of COP26 coming in a few months time. And of course, uh, two weeks ago, G7, uh, after their, their leaders um, meeting, they also came out and put sustainability and climate action as their top priority. And also suggest that it has to be mandatory reporting, uh, embracing TCFD. TCFD is the task force for climate related financial disclosure. Just now what you definitely talk about ESG, environment, social and governance. In the good old day, it was considered as non-financial. But today, anything happens to the governance issue, uh, uh, environment or social issue has a strong financial impact. And along the value chain, you know, investors, financial, afterwards you will hear from Eric, you know, how they look at sustainability and how they can make sustainability integration as a business case to be able to assess to the fast growing ESG funds and sustainability, you know, uh, sustainable finance as well. And in fact, last year we heard a lot of, you know, um, advocacy uh, from uh, uh, investor. And in the next slide, you can see the numbers are in billions and trillions of dollars, you know, um, under principle for invest uh, responsible investment. Today, um, about 
almost 4,000 signatories, and most of them are the leading institutional investor. And look at the asset under management, uh, it's over 100 trillion US dollars. For listed companies like us, you want to have a, a share of the pie, you have to dish out very strong ESG report cards and how they should choose us to invest in our business. And of course, last year, in one year, ESG related um, uh, investment fund uh, nearly tripled to US dollar, $189 billion just in one year. And uh, Larry Fink is a really a, a leader in the institutional investor. BlackRock is actually the world's largest asset manager in the world. So what he said sets the direction for investors. So what he said now is investing companies are expected to disclose their, their net zero emission strategy. In the past, he, he, only, he only highlighted his climate strategy, but this year he highlighted his net zero emission strategy, very specific. And you can look at the bottom of this slide here also, it's through the volumes of you know, bond issuance in the world. 2020's volume doubled that of the previous year. Uh, next slide, please. And we can really feel the heat and the pace of, you know, the race to zero as really gaining momentum within one year of establishment of the so-called race to zero campaign, uh, which is actually now the largest ever alliance representing 50% of the world's GDP and also 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. It is still fast growing. Look at the, the you know, the supporter, 120 countries, 733 cities and still counting. And in the business and the investors, actually today it already exceeded, you know, uh, uh, 3,000 if I'm not mistaken. And we were very, uh, you know, uh, glad that CTL started the journey more than two decades ago. And in fact, in 2019, we joined uh, 87 leading companies in the world at the UN uh, Climate Summit in 2019. I, I have the privilege to be there to witness the action and CDL has the strong leadership with our CEO, you know, pledged to support, to join this um, 1.5 degree business ambitions, you know. And uh, next slide, please. So whether businesses want to do it or take the lead to do it, you will be changed very fast. So it's either you take the lead to change or be changed by our so-called green consumerism that doesn't talk about it. The data is very clear. The message is very clear. And in fact, we are not just talking about the millennials, we are talking about the so-called Gen Z. Actually, they have started joining the workforce in 2019. So these are the people who are going to be the business decision maker, investors, consumers. And this will be a really very you know, strong force for change. And interestingly, in ASEAN, we have a very young population. Over 64% are below 35 years old. Can you imagine five years, 10 years later, these people, these are the young people who are going to drive political agenda, business agenda, investment agenda. So how you design and produce your products are very important. And how do you look at the whole life cycle? You know, look at the circular economy, not just looking at buy, you know, use and throw away. So just now we talk about the reduce, reuse, recycle, and all those are really changes that are in our way, you know, it, you know, in front of us already, we cannot wait anymore. In the next slide, you can also see that in Singapore, almost every day you, you know, open the, you know, the newspaper, watch news. I bet with you, there will be green plan, you know, news about, you know, because there are five ministries looking at it, whether it is the national development, green building, you know, um, uh, uh, EV or trade and industry and uh, even education. How are we going to bring everybody on board to help Singapore to become a city in nature, not just a city in, in, in a garden city and, uh, and how everyone can contribute to sustainable living. And uh, just now we talk about the reduce, reuse, recycle because our landfill is, you know, filling up very fast. Energy is very important because in the end of the day, energy is the biggest contributor to carbon emission and that actually caused, you know, the global warming and, and, and all. So um, we, we know about in the building sector, especially we are under a lot, a lot of pressure. A lot of regulations are, are, are really, you know, uh, accelerating to drive green buildings. And how do we design, build and our so-called, uh, you know, development into embracing, you know, greener, healthier lifestyle is 
really very important. And how do we, you know, um, tap into the fast growing green economy, the green job, the innovations, and build a very resilient future. Uh, in the next slide, you know, um, allow me to share a little bit of our, you know, uh, green journey and the business case. And uh, uh, CDL was established in 1963 only with eight employees. And today we are operating in 29 countries and regions. And what we are proud of is not just the business growth or geographical growth, but uh, we actually started the journey very early since 1995. Uh, in the next slide, you can see that, you know, that is actually we summarize our 26 years of journey into a very simple slide. Uh, in the core of it, the business model is our corporate ethos, conserving as we construct as we manage our property and also as we interface with our consumers as well. So today you have to be integrated into everything we do, how we come up with our product, you know, build stronger manufacturer capital, embrace it into our corporation, uh, you know, corporation and build stronger trust and organizational capital. And all these, you know, build stronger relationship with our consumers, our community, and all these will actually contribute to the financial capital and natural capital. And uh, we actually started our journey early and green, green building has always been our bread and butter and top priority. And what we are looking at is not just today or past, we look at future. So we make use of our, you know, we embrace our sustainability and use our report um, to present our sustainability blueprint since 2017, we actually set goals that align ourselves with Paris Agreement and, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals, the so-called SDG. And uh, there are 17 goals, 169 targets. Not every business you know, uh, uh, can embrace everything. So for us, we started with nine goals and now we have embraced 14 goals that we can make a difference, we can create an impact. So um, the bottom of it is actually a very complex reporting uh, standard and how we actually, you know, create this building block from 2008, we published the first sustainability report in Singapore and uh, using the GRI, Global Reporting Initiative Standards from 2008. And then we embraced the uh, carbon disclosure and integrated reporting. Every uh, year, we actually build up, you know, the, the uh, a more robust standards and goals. And just now I talk about uh, TCFD, science-based target is very important. You don't set a goal plucking from air. You have to base on science and also proven track record. And CSB and the uh, uh, climate disclosure standards are all gaining traction. And uh, let's go to the next slide to look at the so-called strategy and allow me to simplify it with four pillars that you know underpin our so-called ESG strategy. The four I is has to be integrated into your strategy, the first one, integration. The whole company, every business unit must know that the company is going to the same direction. So it is fully integrated from our board to the management, to the operational uh, level. Innovation is important. You can't just talk without finding solution technologies, you know, how to lower your carbon footprint if you don't tap on new technologies and, te and the solutions. And uh, investment is important. Put money where your mouth is. Invest in technology, green building feature to accelerate action. And as an investing company, look at new source, growing source of ESG funds. And whatever we do that's impact, positive or negative, be transparent and share with you know, your, your stakeholders and investors. And what are the three final you know, de deliverables that we are looking at? Because building sector has high environmental impact, accounting for almost 38% of greenhouse gas emission globally. So decarbonization has always been our top priority. And just now I talk about, you know, we joined the world movement of 1.5 degree, you know, business ambition. And also digitalization innovation is key to move the needle. And uh, last but not least is disclosure and communication. Communicate with your investor, your stakeholder, and even the communities at large. And the next slide will show that, in fact, brand leaders, you know, are expected to take a long-term view, invest in uh, innovation, not just looking at, you know, short-term profit making. So, in fact, studies show that very interestingly, history also show that companies that invest in innovation through crisis actually outperform the rest during recovery. But the challenge is everybody agree we have to change, we have to innovate. But Look at the data, only 21% of the so-called um, companies feel that they have the right set of 
expertise, knowledge and ability to drive change. So how are we going to build up this, you know, capability to tap onto the, you know, opportunity? Don't waste a crisis. And how do we step up change? It's a really a challenge to company, large or small company. And uh, in fact, uh, since 2014, we have also, you know, um, uh, embraced a materiality study, engaging our internal and external stakeholder to tell us whether what are the top issues, whether we are aligned. So in, since 2017, interestingly, the top ESG issues from our external and internal stakeholder has been innovation. And this latest study, the results show that uh, health and safety issue, you know, become the first, no surprise, because we are still under the impact of, of you know, a pandemic. But innovation, product, service, responsibility, you know, climate change, you, you know, economic contribution and energy efficiencies are still very, very important. And that are, these are the issues that companies should really um, concentrate, listen, address to what your investor, what your stakeholder tell you. And uh, the next one is actually the next slide. So that how are you going to adapt your findings and create products that consumers want? So these are some of the examples that we embrace, you know, uh, health and safety issue and uh, technology and uh, even uh, uh, like greenery is very important. We've been, you know, still working from home now, like most of us. And uh, how do we, you know, maintain sanity, you know, getting close to nature, even without traveling a long, you know, distance. So Amber Park, actually, we invest 65% of the overall site area uh, dedicated to landscape, luxe greenery, water feature, facility, fitness, you know, um, uh, amenities uh, versus the, you know, mandatory requirement of 40%. And we also empower, you know, our home users with, you know, technology to test, you know, the, you know uh, air quality and also embrace, you know, um, even paint that is antibacterial and antifungal in our new generation home, like house on, on, on the handy. And the same technology and uh, even more advanced technology apply to our commercial property and the uh, mixed development, you know, that when we are planning, you know, uh, how we design, build and manage our building. In the next slide, that is actually the history, some of the history, the past one that there some in the audience may be staying in some of our, you know, CDL home or working in our CDL properties already. So we are not just starting today because it's trendy, because it's fashionable. And, uh, you know, you have to look at the history and track record of the, uh, of, of the company and uh, to see, you know, whether they really truly believe in it or, you know, just using it as a marketing gimmick. So for us, we have almost 20 years of commitments to green building and introduced the first eco condominium even in 2002 before sustainability and climate change becomes the, you know, hot topic. And the same thing, and some of you probably have visited our the first eco mall in Singapore called the City Square Mall. And we also look at super low energy building, not just green building, but looking at how we can raise the bar and even looking at long term zero energy building. And in fact, under CDL's name, we have two zero energy building. The one is actually at Singapore Botanic Garden. It's the CDL Green Gallery. has opened since 2013. has been operating solely on solar energy. And the one, the roof garden of City Square Mall, we also set up our sustainability academy, a hub to build capacity. Again, it is also relying on solar energy only. And uh, next slide, please. And all these actually help us to make a bold pledge in February to pledge to World Green Building Council's, you know, uh, carbon uh, net zero commitment uh, by 2030. Very tall order, very challenging, but with track record, with expertise, with commitment, most importantly, and bringing our value chain together, we are, you know, really, you know, confident that we have to do it and we need to do, to achieve it. And then next slide, please. And in fact, almost every day you hear some, you know, people talk about advancing net zero and, and all. And uh, this particular uh, chart is actually showcasing the so-called ROI. What are the return of investment? We are a private listed company. We need to, you know, generate, you know, value for our consumer and investor. We need to look at the business value. You know, we need to survive. You have to look at the balance, you know, a, a very balanced triple bottom line. So this chart shows that we have maintained as a premium, you know, brand and a ranked top among most of the independent sustainability global ranking. And we also help to actually reduce safe costs 
And every year we save about up to $4 million a year in terms of utility bills and all that by applying energy efficient technologies and heatings and all. And what we are very proud of is actually we embrace you know, we integrate it into our operations, not just internal stakeholders. And we have actually achieved 100%, you know, commitment by our tenants in our green lease since 2017. So everybody's are on board to help, you know, to green our environment. The next slide is actually a report card that we want, you know, investors and financiers to look at our commitment. And this report card is not created by us. It's actually we compile the independent sustainability ratings and ranking, whether it's this carbon disclosure project. And we are very uh, honored to be the only A-list company in the Southeast Asia, including Hong Kong, for climate strategy and water resources as well. And uh, there are a lot of other like MSCI ESG rating, triple A since 2010, which is really a tall order. And these are all subject to annual assessment. We have to keep running and uh, make sure that annually we pass the exam with flying color. And uh, for two years now, we are ranked by the Global 100 Most Sustainable Corporation in the World that is actually announced in the World Economic Forum every year in Davos. And we have been ranked top amongst all real estate listed company um, since last year. So next slide shows that um, this is one of the examples that we can actually make use of a strong ESG performance and track record to give uh, confidence to our financier. And this is actually um, the sustainable finance of our business case. In 2017, we actually wrote out the first green bond by a Singapore company using the uh, tapping on sustainable finance to accelerate action and green building movement. And over the last four years, we have actually uh, accumulated 2.5 billion worth of sustainable finance, whether it's in the form of green loan or even SDG innovation loan, tap onto resources to help us drive innovation and technology. And of course, the latest one, actually, um, thanks to bankers like, you know, um, UOB is part of this as well. And our 1.2 billion green loan. And, and I will leave to the expert financiers to talk more about the, the sustainable finance. Okay, the last slide, you know, that we are looking at is when we talk about triple bottom line, you talk about the ESG and all that. In the end of the day, we want to contribute to the planet because without a healthy planet, there's no healthy people and market. No market, no businesses can thrive and create profits and prosperity for your own um, employees, for your investors and for the community and our value chain. We have a long value chain supplier, contractor, also rely on the strength of our business to grow. And how do we communicate at the call of this triple bottom line? It's not just about making money. You have to look at the overall long-term sustainable development goal. So at the call of it, you can see it's actually sustainability that help us to present very healthy triple bottom line. And uh, I can close it with, you know, Black Rocks, you know, saying that they actually believe that companies that understand their overall impact on the environment and society and align their business and operations with the UN SDGs who have the potential to become market leader, become more resilient. And uh, those that fail, there is cause for inaction, you know, those fail to adapt will likely face more pressure from regulators and reputational repercussion also. So with that, thank you, you know, for listening and I will be happy to, to discuss more. Thank you. Esther, would you like would you like to talk would you like to talk about the resources? There was a question in um, the chat where oh, I, have, um, yeah. I, I think this is this is a resource that you, that um, the our audience can reach into, right? To to learn we, a little bit more. Oh, sure, sure. I'll be more than happy to you know for you to share the the deck with our you know and also probably visit our. Uh, CDLSustainability.com. We actually started uh, set up a website since 2017. Uh, we have our corporate website, but we have so much to talk about on sustainability. We actually, you know, set up a dedicated sustainability website, and there are a lot of resources and information there. All our 14 sustainability reports are all posted online, and with a whole host of you know sustainability related uh, policies and practices, all posted online. Yeah. You know, I always feel I'm being I'm being so unfair to Esther to to kind of hem her into 15 minutes because she could go on for an hour. But I think what what she has um, shown us is really like is really that with so much action happening in the market and in the world, the truth is 
don't be panicked by it. When there's this much action going on, it means that the resources really are out there to help. Now, in, in July, the government will be launching um, Climate Action Week. And as a result of, and, in, and a lot of content will be generated out of Climate Action Week and in the coming weeks. So please keep your ears glued. I'm going to give a plug, um, check on CNA, CNA online because there will be many reports coming out as well as resources that you will be able to tap on. And some of these resources could end up being um, government policy grants, et cetera, to help companies make that transition. Because as a nation, I think we're committed to this goal. So at this stage, I'd like to call another poll so that all of you can get your fingers, your fingers moving a little bit. Now, could you let us know, does your company plan to appoint a chief sustainability officer? Yes, within the next six, within the next six to 12 months. Yes, within the next one or two years. Not sure, we're still thinking about it. Not sure, I don't know, but they could be. Um, no, we are not. So could you take a, a couple seconds to answer this and let's see, let's see what our, what's happening with the companies in our audience. Okay. Are the results ready? Okay, so clearly, I mean, a good a good quarter a quarter of our audience here will be appointing a chief sustainability officer, right? And then half of half of you are not sure. But you know, honestly, this is nothing to freak out about. It's Esther and her company really had a huge head start. Now, you know, I like to kind of turn the attention to if you imagine. CDL being this incredibly established company, and then you'll be an incredibly established company, but two with very different journeys. At this juncture, let me welcome Eric. Eric, could you tell us what that UOB journey is and what is, what is the wisdom or the encouragement that the audience needs to hear? Absolutely, Dashing, thank you, and uh, morning to everyone. Um, you know, over the last, uh, um, you know, uh, a session where Esther was kind of walking us through the big landscape of everything that's going on with sustainability. It can get very overwhelming when you think about the amount of activity. So what I like to do in my time is really just kind of boil it down to three main things that I'd like you guys to, number one, really chew on, understand, and then walk away with, yeah? So if uh, we go to the next page, one of the things I want to share first is and you guys can feel this, right? In the last 12 to 24 months, sustainability, especially in our uh, uh, geographical space of uh, Singapore and Asia, it's really exploded. And the question is, what's going on? And what are the signals we have to really be paying attention to, either as uh, companies, executives, board members, or individuals, right? Here, we lay out the three main things that are going on that we think as UOB is very important to pay attention to. The first thing is, as Esther mentioned, governments rolling out sustainable development plans. Now, the question is why, right? So all of us have heard about the Paris Agreement. All of us have heard about the commitments to, towards net zero, but all of these uh, commitments mean nothing if you don't have big, uh, powerful bodies like governments uh, making that commitments and then coming up with national development plans. Uh, Esther mentioned the Singapore Green Plan. This is very important for us operating in Singapore as well as the region because it's fundamentally going to change the way we live, work, play, et cetera, et cetera, right? This will result in changes in regulations. It will result in changes in policies that we need to be conscious of because, you know, uh, take buildings, for example. We already have building codes that have sustainability standards called Green Mark. Now, I want you to imagine regulations like this being now spread out to every part of our uh, society and our economy. Every business is going to be impacted by some form of an evolving regulation along those lines. There's another thing you guys would have heard of, carbon credits, carbon taxes, right? This is increasingly over time going to increase the cost of doing business in a fossil fuel or carbon intensive way which means us as companies, we need to figure out how to shape our business models towards more sustainable ways of doing things. The, the second big thing that's happening here, asset managers, Esther also mentioned. Now, why do we care? At the end of the day, money, unfortunately in the modern world, makes the world go round. 
And when large asset managers like BlackRock and everybody else is getting into the game, start to harden their stance on sustainability, this means, number one, we are going to be affected in terms of our share price, in terms of total shareholder return, by our ability to demonstrate a credible path of sustainability. Number two, even if you say to yourself, hey, you know, Eric, I'm not a public listed company. I own my own business and I can pretty much uh, figure out what to do. You also are part of a global supply chain where either downstream of you, upstream of you, or your own customers are going to be demanding more and more of sustainable products and practices. So in a way, by asset managers really starting to harden their stance of sustainability, and you know, determining where these equity dollars go, everybody who hopes to be able to uh, you know, uh, create more value through their companies needs to respond. And that's where we also see a huge uh, demand from our own customers demanding more sustainable products, right? Esther mentioned all the sustainable finance that a company like CDL has been able to access uh, you know, over, over their illustrious history. And this is very important because going forward, just imagine those who can access green finance or sustainable finance versus industry peers who cannot, right? So it becomes more and more differentiated that your ability to access sustainable finance can start to differentiate between industry winners and industry losers. So, you know, just something I want to kind of lay out there because it's a very noisy sometimes when we talk about sustainability, but we really do need to pay attention because of some of these big mega trends. Right. Now, if we move on to the next page, what I'd like to now shift gears and share with you is, is it all only about doing good or is there real money to be made here? And if there's real money to be made here, where and how? Right. So if you take a look at this piece of research, it suggests that even just in our backyard alone right, of Singapore and Southeast Asia, there's a trillion dollars worth of sustainable opportunities on an annual basis that we could tap into as our part of the world continues to transform from existing ways of living, breathing, manufacturing, and working to where we need to be in order to meet the Paris Agreement uh, net zero uh, uh, commitments, right? And you can see this trillion dollars worth of opportunities largely spread out uh, around four major areas. Number one, sustainable energy and resources. It is a reality today that across our geographical footprint of Asia and ASEAN, uh, Singapore and ASEAN, that we are still predominantly fossil fuel dependent for energy generation. Now, I want you to imagine a world where we swing over all of burning coal and burning gas over to renewables like wind, solar, geothermal, or hydro. And then you can begin to see the scale of investments that will be required in order for us to uh, generate renewable energy. That's a lot of money we're talking about at play here. The second area is ASEAN is a major contributor to the food supply and food security of the world. In fact, if you look at how much rice just comes out from ASEAN alone, it's 40% of the global production, right? Not to mention every other form of agriculture we, we, uh, we support. Food and agriculture has ecological and ecosystem impacts. So we need to be able to figure out how to finance and support swinging over to much more sustainable ways of uh, growing food. The third one is around efficient industries, right? Manufacturing, again, is a big part of the ASEAN growth story. And having our manufacturing capabilities and industries swing over to working within planetary boundaries, right? This is a concept that will be interesting for all of us to, to find out more about. Uh, that's very important. And finally, you know, this is an area that CDA and ESTA are very familiar with, green and connected cities. How do we uh, ensure that our built environment is as uh, carbon friendly and uh, low intensive as possible? So what I'm trying to convince you here and, and share with you the message is, this is the time where because of this massive alignment and global will, to swing over to a sustainable future, all that money and all that investment is going to really go quite big here. So the important part for us as companies, bank included, is to figure out where we can both do our business, do well, as well as build the products and services that allow us to support doing good, right? 
Now, if we swing over to the next page, I would like to quickly take a moment. I, I want to make sure we leave space for Rebecca's remarks as well. You know, just to sh share how UOB is doing this, right? Now, we're a financial intermediary. We're a bank. We are in the business of money. Now, our most critical role is choosing where money goes, right? And how we channel our financing can make winners of industries or where we take our money away, these industries begin to sunset. Right. Of course, we don't do this, you know, uh, uh, absent of government regulations, as well as where we think industry trends are going. And here you can see where we've created three flagship sustainable finance frameworks that recognize where that real opportunity for sustainable financing is. The first one is around smart city. Here we're talking about renewable energy, water treatment, waste treatment and efficient transportation. Right. The second one, green real estate. You know, as Esther's already demonstrated, this is an extremely well understood and very established asset class, right? Uh, that is uh, going to be critical to our future. And then the third one, the green circular economy. This covers all of our manufacturing as well as uh, industries. Again, I mentioned about uh, the planetary boundaries. And what we do is we align our key product capabilities here to the SDGs that we're supporting. And we're proud to say uh, UOB is one of the few banks across ASEAN uh, where we positively align to all 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we can do that because of the diversity of our business as well as the geographical spread that we have. Now, real quick, uh, just one minute on the next page, uh, a very tangible example of how not, it's not only about making money for us, but it's really about creating tangible environmental impact. We have the first integrated solar power ecosystem financing program called U-Solar, right? And this is where we bring together solar panel uh, manufacturers, installers, residential uh, property owners, as well as corporates that want to invest in solar energy. And to date, what we've been able to do, if you look on the top right here, is we've been able to create additional solar energy capability and capacity that is the equivalent of taking 1.6 million tons of CO2 avoided out of the system over the useful life of the solar panels. And if you want to think about what that means in real world, because most of us don't think in tons of CO2 emissions, it's the equivalent of planting 100 million trees or taking 350 cars off the road. And this is how we as a bank move beyond just money into real environmental impact. So Dashing, on that, let me hand that back to you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, a, a real, you know, the, the point is, this is where the world is going. And unless you jump on this bandwagon, you're going to be left sorely behind. I mean, just so that you understand, um, Eric had shared that there's $1 trillion worth of opportunities. And one aspect that he did not put in the $1 trillion is communications. We as a company, in fact, will see a more than tenfold jump in investment from our corporate partners in the communication of their green, of their green credentials, their green efforts um, over the next year. So this, it already signals to us that there is this shift and it's, it's very, very real, hence this webinar. So actually at this juncture, I want to invite Rebecca, um, who is going to share what we as the National Media Network is doing, and I'm, and I think that um, we had a side chat that she will also address one of the questions um, that was on the side panel. Um, but at this point, over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tashin. Good morning, and uh, thank you to Eric and uh, Esther, my fellow panelists, for doing all the heavy lifting. So that leaves me to be able to have the luxury of focusing uh, very specifically on a topic that I'm really passionate about in the entire uh, scheme of things, right? Which is about uh, the internal engagement and employee engagement when it, it comes to sustainability. Very briefly, um, my career, I spent a third of my career in media as a journalist, a third in government, both in communications and policy, and another third in private sector, mainly in financial services. So whilst I've always been working with words, one of the very old but true cliches that I would like to share with uh, the audience today is that actions do actually speak louder than words, especially when it comes to sustainability. So the literal meaning of the word sustainability in itself denotes a long-term commitment, right? It's something that you need to maintain for the long run. You've heard this from Esther as well. It's not a trend. It's not a fad. 
And, you know, uh, Eric also touched on that, about how there are a lot of new opportunities. And whilst, you know, they've covered all the uh, very complex business decisions and commitment that it takes uh, to be in the sustainability game in the long run, uh, I would like to touch on something that keeps, uh, you know, senior management up at night as well. How do you keep your employees engaged on this for the long run? Um, communication, Stasha mentioned that, it's all about good narrative. But the truth is the stories that we tell about ourselves are only good stories if they're believable, right? So hence, I firmly believe that, you know, we first need to be authentic in our values and our actions as an organization. Uh, and across the board, it really doesn't matter which sector you're in, uh, you know, how big or how small your business is, whether you're MNC or a big corporate or a SME or even a startup, right? Every single organization out there that's doing business has an impact on both your external stakeholders, your customers, as well as your employees, your internal stakeholder. Simon Sinek, the author of uh, Start With Why, famously tweeted that customers will never love a brand until the employees love it first. So that is why when we think about brand equity and reputation, we need to be very aware that it is a 360 degree conversation. So uh, moving on to the next slide, let me first touch very briefly on the role that media organizations play in driving this conversation, this 360 conversation. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about carbon footprint and impact measurement. For media organizations, there's been some early research and work done by the WWF in the UK back in the early 2000s, I believe, and working in tandem with some of the organizations, media organizations in the UK, such as The Guardian and the BBC, uh, you know, looking at how media organizations can measure their impact. This is the Responsible Media Forum report, which was first published in 2013 and then updated in 2020, which looks at this concept of the brain print of media and how media organizations can offset their carbon footprint by the brain print they produce. So very simply put, brain print is the measurement uh, of the awareness uh, of the impact that's created. Of, of all our communication activities, both positive and negative. So in many ways, not just media organizations, right, but all organizations that communicate can think about our brain print uh, as a concept. You know, what are some of the positive things that we are doing out there to, to influence actions? And, and, and how do we uh, drive greater awareness on sustainability? And if you pause to think a little bit about that, brain print is important because it's essentially one step upstream from footprint. So we agree that through the info we consume, you know, our intentions and behaviors are influenced and shaped. Then essentially media organizations in our ability to raise awareness and drive some of these important conversations through the content that we put out is responsible for this brain print that in turn shapes actions. So I hope that sort of makes sense in the flow of things. Uh, going very quickly to the next slide, these are just some examples, right, of uh, media organizations globally that's been making an impact. I mean, we all know the BBC has been doing a lot of work. Uh, apart from its brain print, it has actually developed a free carbon calculator in a collaboration with the BAFTA, which is now being used by more than 200 production companies and broadcasters in the UK television industry. So actually beyond your core business, there are many ways that uh, you know, we can think about how we can influence uh, sustainability action out there. And of course, the Japanese media company, uh, the whole focus on environmental issues and sustainability somewhat catalyzed uh, due to the devastating 2011 Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdowns following that very, very tragic tsunami and earthquake. So yes, indeed, there's been a reawakening of, of uh, you know, consciousness. And uh, let's go to the next slide, which uh, will, I will then share about what we have been doing at MediaCorp in Singapore. Uh, focusing very much on walking the talk, right, and uh, our internal actions. So as an organization that cares and a company of good, we are committed to sustainable corporate practices. Uh, this is our MediaCorp campus. Some of you may have visited us before. Uh, our green building has recently been recertified for BCA Green Mark Platinum. And of course, throughout the entire building, you know, we adopt best practices such as energy and water usage, monitoring, uh, light, lighting, using motion sensors. 
uh, air conditioning, and of course we have a comprehensive uh, recycling program uh, and using sustainable materials. And even our internal procurement guidelines are guided by sustainability practices. Now, this is important, of course, because uh, as the national media network, you know, our operations are pretty much uh, almost round the clock, right? So uh, internal practices are very much important to us as well in, in our sustainability practice. And of course, you, some of you may have read in the press uh, that we recently appointed a Chief Sustainability Officer, who is also our Editor-in-Chief, Walter. And this is a signal that we are sending uh, on our long-term commitment to sustainability. Uh, because essentially, this is a marathon, right? Uh, the question in the in the chat asked, you know, how much must brands do before customers can recognize that, you know, it is being sustainable? Uh, the short answer is, no effort is too small, and it is not a uh, overnight, uh, you know, effort. It has to be a commitment, and it will take time sometimes uh, for it to become apparent that you know you are uh, adopting sustainable practices but we start by walking the talk right and we start with going inside out uh, so talking about inside out on the next slide i would like to just share briefly uh, about our internal engagement with employees now this is a very big part of walking the talk for us at mediacorp uh, we on the left you see our overall csr framework uh, but as part of the CSR framework, driving sustainability is a key pillar for us. And through our learning journeys and conversations internally, uh, we constantly curate content, drive conversations, we conduct workshops, talks, we organize contests and discussions. And in the pre-COVID days, of course, we had physical activities as well. Uh, this year, we're focusing on a few important themes. Uh, food, you know, we heard both Eric and uh, Esther touch on that, food and food waste. Uh, and of course, other important uh, topics uh, such as paper and packaging, energy consumption, e-waste. And the truth is, as some of you have acknowledged in the chats, right, the questions, it uh, sustainability in itself is a very big, broad topic, right? There are 17 UN SDGs. You can never stop talking about it. And, you know, we're just getting started. So uh, one anecdote that I would like to share uh, is that I'm very heartened by the level of commitment and participation uh, in the uh, in the internal discussions. Every time we run one of these workshops, we try to cap the numbers so that we can have, uh, you know, deeper engagements. And the session always uh, so-called sell out in half an hour. Right, so moving on to the next slide, I'm aware that we're running out of time. As a national media network, we reach more than 95% of Singapore across ages, across our multiple platforms and various official languages. So we're talking about just about everyone every day, right? So this key role that we play here is about driving the important conversations and thought leadership, which is, of course, in support of the Singapore Green Plan. So very recently, we hosted the CNA Leadership Summit 2020 with a theme on green recovery, bringing together leaders from across government, private sector, and community to discuss how sustainable practices can both boost and transform the economy. Some of you may have been there. Uh, if you're not, it's available on YouTube. We have also stepped up, uh, next slide please, our efforts in promoting awareness and action through our content. Uh, since August last year, I think CNA has produced more than 30 hours of documentaries, news features, uh, our Climate Conversations podcast, more than 36 episodes have been streamed and downloaded 62,000 times and more. And these are all part of uh, increasing awareness, driving education, as well as conversations. Uh, CNA Digital has garnered more than 10 million page views for content that's dedicated to sustainability and climate change. But apart from news and current affairs, you know, there are many ways we also consciously incorporate sustainability awareness into our edutainment content. So those cute cartoon characters you see there are from Little Wow, our latest uh, 3D animation edutainment series for children. You know, we can start them young. And uh, Dill, that little pigeon there in the corner, the blue pigeon, uh, he hates plastic bags. Yeah. So I think this is one of the reasons why our partners see an uh, impact in working with us on content. Uh, because of our omni-channel network and our ability to reach just about everyone every day. One example here is the CNA Insider series on food waste, which we produce in collaboration with DBS. And because of this amplification that MediaCorp brings with our platforms, reach and content, apart from just, you know, putting out content, we are also able to galvanize communities in action, right? Uh, 
some examples here. Uh, some time back, we held a beach cleanup together with Xing Xiong. And of course, I think many of you are aware we have a long standing collaboration with Daikin on the Saving Gaia program earlier on. Um, so we would like to believe that it's in our DNA, right? And it's in our DNA for some time. And uh, yeah, some of you may remember this catchy jingle. As far as you can see, on the land and out to sea. There's something very wrong And it's time to change Right, so um, you've seen the statistics from Esther, right? About millennials and Gen Zs who are very conscious about sustainability. So I'd just like to share very quickly a story, an anecdote. I was interviewing for an SG United trainee to come work with us on sustainability issues. And I asked her, why do you want this job? And she said, Oh, do you know to this day I can still sing you the Saving Gaia jingle? <laughs> that's how passionate she is, you know, and I was really heartened because I think that's brand equity working very well for MediaCorp there, that, uh, you know, a talent that's out there um, actually see us as an employer of choice because of the work that we've been doing in, in driving the sustainability course. So let me just end here in the interest of time by inviting all like-minded partners to walk the talk together to further this important cause. And going back to that excellent first question, uh, you know, again, no effort is too small. You know, we heard about circular economy and it sounds like a very big word, but uh, you don't have to be a big business to uh, practice circular economy. There are startups that are able to practice, uh, you know, circular economy uh, business model as well. Uh, for example, recently we invited Crunch Cutlery, which is a startup in Singapore that produces edible cutlery made out of healthy ingredients. So if you think about it, there are many ways. One is operational, transactional, maybe in the products and services that you offer as a company. It's uh, you know, deliberately sustainable. You choose sustainable materials. It can also be motivational. You can uh, help to nudge consumer action. For example, uh, I'm a big coffee aficionado and I support you know, cafes that encourage people to bring their own cup to nudge behavior change, to use less paper and plastic. And, you know, we talk again about transformational business models. And yeah, you can be a startup or SME and still uh, be part of this sustainable value chain. Yeah, actually riding on what Rebecca has just said and some of the questions that are coming in, I think very often Executive Insights we welcome a lot of smaller companies, right? Not, not every company is on the stature of a CDL or UOB. Um, but what we want to say is that I think the key word here is leverage, right? So if you can consciously be plugged in into the conversation, um, and that could be through MediaCorp or other channels like um, Esther has been really busy in the chat box giving resources on the side. Thank you so much, Esther. You know, plug into those, uh, leverage on those resources. Don't go it alone because it is costly and it is extremely energy and time consuming and effort consuming to go it alone. So there are lots of bodies, um, even the, like, for example, what Rebecca is saying, our content, um, our, you know, sections within CNA that you can leverage on. So don't start from ground up. You do not have to. So actually on that note, I come to the final slide and I was hoping that I could encapsulate what I'm calling uh, green soul searching, right? that it's a starting point for your brand strategy. So what are, what are these, these six things? I think you would need to start off to, to, and ask yourself, what do my customers value in terms of going green, right? You need to understand that because then you can align your brand purpose to these green concerns. You know, sometimes you might find that it does, and sometimes you might find that it doesn't, or that it will take a little bit more time before it does. Then what are the key drivers of my brand's ESG efforts? Because that is aligned to your, would be aligned to your brand purpose and uh, what you're producing and you know, what is your economic concern? And I think Esther brought this up. You know, Esther showed lots and lots of slides about the measures that CDL has put in place, right? And this keeps the, the company honest. And this keeps a track on whether you're making progress. And there was a question on the side about greenwashing. And greenwashing is an incredibly complicated um, subject matter. So we ourselves in, in creating big um, collaborations with multiple companies, 
it actually comes to a point where it's almost impossible, right, to judge whether a company is greenwashing or not. But one, one way that we look at it is, does the company have a track record or did this company appear out of nowhere knocking on our door, wanting to do something on CNA, thumping their chest about their, about their green efforts? Do they have a track record? And I think a track record is what helps us gauge, um, even ed whether editorially or you know, from an integrity basis, whether there's greenwashing going on. Now, Rebecca brought this in, which was, yes, you can do all this about your customer side, your product side, your work processes, all that, but you know, how do you make your staff become your best green ambassadors, right? And once you're able to do that, then I encourage you, and this is something that we see across multiple partners, which is then once you've settled this sort of stuff internally, how can you co-opt your customers into your efforts, right? What role can they play? You know, are they part of some sort of a, a green focus group that you do? You know, are they involved in activities that you do? Because these really will deepen the brand affinity and lead to that conscious consumer choice, right? And what you want is that con conscious consumer choice for your brand, right? Or your category. So this is um, what I wanted to end with. I think this is probably a slide that we, can, we could all take some time to meditate on if you're starting off on a journey. Um, you know, and um, Esther, would, would you say that when, when you all first started in CDL, these were some, some of the key areas that you started, you kicked off your thinking? Indeed, actually, you know, the SMEs, please, I, I share your pain after walking this journey for 20 years. We started very small, only two person actually, you know, and also multitask, you know, on the comm side and also the CSR. And only 20, in 2014, we really, you know, uh, consolidate, restructure and become a, you know, dedicated sustainability team. Started with four or five staff and now we have 10 because of the growing needs and growing demand. So uh, don't worry about starting small, okay? Stay focused on what matters most to your business and to your investor. Right. And uh, don't get giddy, you know, everybody talking about net zero, I must do it tomorrow. You will lose sleep. So don't worry, stay focused to do what you do, you, you can do best. There are a lot of resources around, you know, and uh, do connect with yes. my LinkedIn and all that. There are a lot, a lot of information sharing there. That, okay, now that is, a, that is a golden invitation to link with Esther on her LinkedIn. Oh. <laughs> um, that, uh, she's an incredible resource and we're always so happy to yeah. have her on. Um, at, at this juncture, um, let's say, um, I think we are really running late. So what we will do is that we will take the questions and respond to them um, as part of the recording of this webinar that we will post on our website. I think that's a better use of time. Um, all of, we've kept all of you for more than an hour and I know that people have meetings to go to. So rather than prolong this, and I'm sure Esther and Eric also have meetings to go to. So we've, we've kind of eaten into their, their time as well. So I hope all of you don't mind um, as an audience, we will be posting this recording on our website. You'll be sent a link and we will be posting answers to some of these key questions there. I hope we've been able to sort of inspire you, demystify bits, kind of tell you what the motivation is and also kind of set you thinking and inspire, inspiring you to take that first step because that's what we need to do. There was actually a question in the chat box that I, we had actually missed asking you how many of you already have a CSO? And yes, that could be the missing ingredient. Perhaps half this room already has a CSO and are well on that journey. But the reality is that it's here. It's not a fad, it's here to stay. We have a planet to protect and we have a planet to protect uh, for our young, you know? Um, so an important goal for all of us and an important legacy. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rebecca, Welcome. for sharing. Um, really appreciate all everyone's time in this. I think this is going to be a continuing conversation. I will not, I would not be surprised if in a couple months time, we will have another webinar around sustainability and where that conversation has moved in our community. Okay, thank you so much everyone for your time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, bye. 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 bye, -bye.